I expect to learn a lot from our from today's um, meeting. Um, it's one of the great features of the Kate Hamburger Colleague that it operates as a think tank, and I I'd love to to tap your thoughts uh, on today's. Uh, topic, um, I will present only part of uh, what I originally um, thought was my project as um, as always um, the exchange and also the changing conditions uh, in the ongoing pandemic um, have um, slightly um, transformed my original plans. Um, so I, I spent much time uh, thinking on uh, Corona, of course, for uh, your book, uh, Werner, that I'm looking forward to. Um, and at the same time, this um, openness um, has been one of the strong points of the Kete Hamoga Center. And uh, I'm looking forward, um, as I said today, to make a point on that strong point, which also means that I, I will leave out a lot uh, today, for example, parts of the historic background, um, parts that deal with the 19th century, um, so I can stick to my half an hour. I'd like to start with a current uh, observation um, that President Trump uh, is a prominent user of Twitter, uh, which is an online platform for shorter communications. And until recently, um, many of his tweets were only criticized outside Twitter for being what they often are. They are divisive, they are inaccurate or outright lies. This changed in May of this year, so only very recently. So that was new. Um, and uh, Trump's message that mail-in ballots to be used for the presidential elections later this year will be fraudulent was marked as inaccurate by Twitter. A few days later, under the impression of growing protests after the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis, Trump announced that he might react by bringing in armed forces and open fire on protesters, and Twitter marked the tweet as glorifying violence, which was a violation of the platform's terms and conditions. These measures received great attention um, because they seem to mark a policy change, and uh, that's why they deserve our attention because they highlight a particular problem that involves the interaction between private but globally effective norms, such as the terms and conditions of an internet platform on the one hand, and legal norms um, on the other. So while Trump criticized Twitter and threatened to introduce legislation against internet providers, Facebook was criticized, not by Trump, um, obviously, because it did not mark postings from Trump in its administration as problematic. Uh, Trump moved quickly and signed an executive order on preventing online censorship just days after Twitter had marked his tweet as untrue. The executive order questions a distinction that has been vital for providers of communication platforms in the US and similar legislation is also in place in other jurisdictions too. In the US, it is to be found in section 230 of the Communications Decency Act from 1996. This provision prevents people from suing providers of an interactive computer service, which uh, includes such uh, platforms as Twitter and Facebook. So they can't be sued for libel if users post um, defamatory messages on their platforms. The law does not treat intermediary website operators as publishers, such as book publishers, for example, or newspaper publishers would be treated. So in this model, the platforms provide an infrastructure but are not responsible for the content. On the other hand, platforms are free to remove or restrict posts that they deem obscene, lewd, lascivious, filthy, excessively violent, harassing, or otherwise objectionable. So Trump's order argues that if a platform acts in bad faith, it should no longer be treated as a provider for other people's messages, but as a publisher and be accountable for the content. Trump argues that when large, powerful social media companies censor opinions with which they disagree, they exercise a dangerous power. Twitter 
Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube wield immense power to shape the interpretation of public events. So it complicates uh, analysis that this statement is basically correct. Uh, within the art world, Facebook's censorship of nudity has caused uh, considerable debate. I'm just mentioning two cases uh, here. A French teacher was banned from Facebook because he uploaded a picture of Gustave Courbet's L'Origine du Monde. In the end, the case was settled uh, outside court. And the photographer Spencer Tunick, who's famous for his mass scenes of ordinary people in the nude, which he photographs in public spaces, uh, joined a group of artists who expressed their criticism on Facebook's censorship. Now, it is debatable in itself uh, why artistic freedom has to be um, short-circuited with mostly female nudity. Um, so there's more to that. Uh, again, multiple views are on offer here. Artists have formed an alliance to point out Instagram's handling of non-streamlined eroticized content. Artists against social media censorship. They debate uh, a lot of issues here, body shaming, queer and non-binary sexual identities, and they present a line of cases in the form of an online exhibition. Now with a special interest to um, communities and their definition and the normative role in mind, the artist's conclusion is interesting here because they formulate a government analogy uh, it arises from a structural analysis in which the platform is compared to a feudalistic state by the artists. This denotes a lack of control, and I've tried to put that into a diagram. Uh, it means an imbalance of powers as well as a perceived lack of participation in the areas of policy and decision making. From the perspective of the user or citizen, an organization exercises power. Uh, there's a fundamental difference between the kind of norms that are at play here. Governments rely on laws, internet platforms rely on contracts and the large set of terms and conditions that come, comes with them. There are sometimes termed community rules, which is also interesting because it implies that all the users are part of a single community, uh, although uh, they're not. They are customers who are bound by the terms and conditions. Now, in the model of uh, a, a, democr whoops, a democracy, although no longer uniformly accepted, uh, we have to say, the exercise of power is controlled uh, by several factors, such as the balance of powers, the rule of law, elections, and other institutions, just to name a few. The individual is um, not only subject to authority, but enjoys a number of fundamental freedoms and rights against this authority, against the democratic state. As a footnote, I'm aware that the, the European Union is not a state. The symbol stands here for the European states plus the EU, who is a related but separate authority entity. And uh, of course, there's the democratic deficit and, and all that, but um, I'm not going into these details here. Against the platform, the user is in a different position. There's no such thing as the rule of law to bind an internet platform. However, there's a growing opinion that there should be some kind of legal control. What remains is the option to terminate the contract and cease using the platform. This is difficult when a platform appears to be the only sensible option for a particular type of communication. Uh, or when mostly all your social contacts are based on one particular platform. For example, many social clusters communicate on WhatsApp. From my own experience as a parent, I can say that parents often do communicate in clusters on WhatsApp, families, uh, and I'm not a user, but there's often a very strong group pressure to use that particular platform which as a rule is the largest one. So I'm mostly turned down when I um, offer to form social clusters on Threema, for example, which is a Swiss platform that focuses on user privacy or Telegram. So the overall status quo is that um, many of these social um, media platforms turn into a 
practical, effectual monopoly in terms of cluster or community communication. So let's look at some more alternatives. Um, interestingly, uh, whereas the big global platforms present themselves as communities, for example, by presenting their terms and conditions as community rules, smaller competitors try to reappropriate the term of community. Uh, here by advertising that users can find their perfect community here at the bottom of the Mastodon landing page. Other alternatives are uh, regional. Uh, they focus on their regionality uh, to present themselves as a, an alternative community. A uh, prominent example is the so-called Russian Facebook. Uh, they even emulate the design and the appearance of Facebook. Formerly v Contacte, and now just vk.ru. It's obvious that they, um, they want to sort of clone the user experience uh, of Facebook for their regional user base um, in Russia. And um, another regional alternative um, is uh, the Chinese platform of WeChat, uh, a leading platform in its own area. Um, it's a combination of WhatsApp, Facebook, eBay, and other functions. And uh, it is also uh, tightly controlled by the Chinese government. That means that it's a little more complicated. Uh, it always gets more complicated when you look at details. Um, not only can a digital platform in itself be powerful because of its factual monopoly-like position on a regional or global market, it can aggregate called governmental power depending on the levels of civil rights, freedom, and censorship. So um, the distance between platform and state and the entrepreneurial freedoms it, it, it enjoys, uh, that makes difference uh, too, as we see in China with WeChat, for example, which is very close to the governmental administration and censorship infrastructure. So this can be modeled into a kind of field concept as defined by uh, Pierre Bourdieu. Without entering the details, it may be enough to point out that the field of digital cultural communication is deeply informed by the balance or imbalance of power. And there's a clear deficit of participation and participation um, options and possibilities on side of the users with corresponding consequences for any social communities that do not fit into the terms and conditions of the digital platform. So the artists against censorship can serve as an example here. The analysis is not new in itself. Uh, I just um, quote from two articles here from The Guardian and The New York Times from uh, 2017 and one uh, which is more recent. Um, they say platforms are too big to serve the public interest, too big to be controlled effectively. Um, billions of messages cannot be scanned by algorithms alone to filter hate speech, fake news, and propaganda, since communication is ultimately based on human understanding and the command of ambivalent meaning. A journalist asked on Twitter for solutions, and one offered was to work with uh, more tailored community networks, networks built for a purpose uh, to accommodate particular communities with tools suited specifically to their needs. And uh, this is a, a computer specialist. Uh, he's one of many um, who's been recently, recently been asked, how can we reform these global um, monopoly, these global monopolies, these um, platforms? And so the basic thought is to reverse the initial uh, control uh, on content and to give it back to the communities who, uh, however, haven't always defined themselves. So I would like to conclude this first half to refer to further reading. Uh, that's, this is an admittedly biased selection of more recent publications, also an older one uh, focusing on questions of digital capitalism and their critique. And on the other hand, just to emphasize uh, the, um, the power of these global platforms, uh, a message, uh, a news, a bit of news that came in last week is that uh, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google combined are now bigger than Japan's entire stock market. So we're 
these are private uh, enterprises, but they are just as powerful in terms of uh, stock market value as, um, as entire stock markets, actually. So a way uh, to control um, monopolies, um, the traditional way, are antitrust laws. Um, as you can see in this little diagram, they mostly refer to the relationship between such platforms. You're, you all recognize the blue, um, the white F on a blue ground from Facebook, and you probably don't know what this other symbol means. It's uh, Wer kennt wen, it's a local German platform that uh, has um, well fallen into oblivion, <laughs> basically. Um, this is um, the main mechanism, I mean, of uh, antitrust laws is to control companies uh, in their relation with, with each other. So they look at monopolies foremost as a problem for competitors and regulative powers are mainly operative on the level of companies and businesses and not so much in the relationship between companies and their customers. So that would, would be customer protection law. And some of the authors uh, whom I just mentioned have they have argued that digital capitalism doesn't work around a price as an outcome of demand and supply, which is a main entity of antitrust uh, laws that um, uh, stand in the center of their regulation efforts. Uh, because in a digital economy, um, these prices are either minimal or even irrelevant. You pay by other means, uh, such as you pay by information uh, that you give on yourself, personal information, communication, freedoms, and so on. Uh, so um, it would be necessary to translate these prices that you pay um, in terms of privacy, for example, into a possible legal framework um, to control these platforms. I'd like to switch now um, to, uh, at first sight, entirely different um, thing, like in the good old um, the days of now for something completely different, um, you'll quickly realize that it's not so different um, at all. And this is to find possible answers um, to the question that Werner just um, asked uh, about how do we how do we define communities? How do we how do we um, take them into a, a proper legal account in in a way? And uh, there's a parallel economy to the digital economy, uh, which is in many ways related. And uh, this is the economy of professional sports. And I'll focus on football. Uh, in fact, this is the legal field I was working in uh, some 20 years ago, uh, to which I'm returning here. Um, there's even a very similar kind of scholarship on sports capitalism, just as it exists on digital capitalism and I'm showing you just a few of the titles. This is not a coincidence. Uh, sports associations act as a kind of entertainment providers uh, in many ways similar to Facebook or YouTube maybe and they're also in a similarly powerful position so you, we can exchange the platform um, to, with sports associations in that diagram and we, we get uh, quite a similar picture. To illustrate this point, uh, I would like you to tell a story about the power of sports associations. And in this case, the International Football Association, FIFA, uh, who in the wake of the World Cup of 2014 in Brazil, um, as it is the rule before such events, the city underwent an intensive phase of restructuring, building, and also demolition because World Cups and Olympics are still quite popular events. They serve as a cash cow, not only for producers of merchandise, but also for real estate investors and venture capitalists. The environments of the Maracanã Stadium in uh, Rio de Janeiro were transformed according, accordingly, and plans were made to demolish some of the old buildings surrounding the stadium to ease access to the stadium. Uh, and it was then the old building of the old so-called Old Indian Museum got caught in the action. 
until 1977, the building, which was erected in 1862, had housed the Museum for Indigenous Cultures. And since 2006, it served as a meeting place for a settlement of about 20 Indigenous people. Uh, in 2013, the city council acquired the property and announced plans to demolish it. The inhabitants were removed from the estate by military police and the government, the city government claimed that FIFA had demanded the demolition of the building for the World Cup. Now that's interesting, the interesting bit because FIFA never explicitly demanded any such move. But the city government could easily operate by the assumption that only few, if any people at all, would question that demand. The, the narrative that FIFA demanded that demolition was so plausible and convincing that uh, they went with it until FIFA itself distanced, distanced its organization from that decision. Now, why did that narrative work so well? Uh, FIFA is not alone in demanding a closely controlled, protected commercial environment for its events and for its sponsors. This includes massive infra infrastructure projects and other measures. Local merchants are forced to close their shops within a designated area around the stadium. Um, even spectators are affected. They're not allowed to wear t-shirts with political messages. And there's a lot of detailed terms and conditions as complicated as Facebooks uh, that are in play here um, when you want to um, watch one of the games. Uh, another small example is how FIFA tells the, told the Brazilian government that uh, it um, should be allowed that beer was to be sold uh, during the games, which uh, initially went, was against Brazilian legislation because uh, that legislation bans alcohol at football matches, but to serve their, their sponsors' interests, um, FIFA demanded um, that the Budweiser beer was to be sold um, during the games. Um, the sports association's monopoly um, is in some ways uh, even uh, more solid than the, the internet companies. Um, they, the sports associations, they act globally. They also are in extremely powerful positions. They manage a monopoly and they know it, as you can see in these very representative um, architectures, um, recently built in Zurich and Lausanne. Um, and that's because international sports competitions are organized around the principle that every association represents their discipline alone, exclusively. There's only one global football association, only one global athletics association, only one global skiing association, etc. And in sports where such a monopoly is not in place, such as boxing or wrestling, for example, uh, the value of international championships is compromised because there can be multiple athlete, athletes holding titles sim simultaneously. So this is why I like to call this organizational principle of fact of monopolies, the Highlander principle, uh, after the motto, there can be only one. So there can be only one uh, foot international football association. Unfortunately, this motto has now crept into the competition. And uh, this is uh, from the Süddeutsche Zeitung, a German daily um, published yesterday. Because that competition has become less fair over the times because financially the champions are given preferential treatment. This has led to a certain boredom in terms of who is likely to win a national championship in several countries. And you see here, it's the case in Italy and Germany, France, uh, Spain, with uh, El Clasico between Barcelona and Madrid. Um, and people realize now that these monoculture, which is uh, not organized uh, really, but uh, a side effect of the uh, financial rules of the uh, global football administration, uh, that it now affects the sports uh, as culture itself, because it takes away something that's very vital, and that's the unpredictability uh, of the sport. So the marketing of the product ultimately harms the product here, which is sports. Now, 
where are now the communities? And that's the final and shortest part. Um, the first two uh, conclusions uh, might be the insight that internet platforms and sports associations are perhaps the opposite uh, of the law as culture paradigm. They prove how culture under commercial conditions becomes normative, technically contractual law with effects that are much further reaching than a contract. These providers of communication and culture, sports culture, also provide their own legal frameworks. And now it's time for a, a confession, namely how the current corona pandemic affected um, this project. I was not only distracted from it by writing that corona essay, but also uh, new insights came to light. Most football matches were called off, at least for a while, to protect spectators and athletes alike. And once the professional leagues resumed their match plan in May and June, no spectators were allowed to be present. And in, in Germany, this format, which is known in English as behind closed doors, was called Geisterspiel or ghost games. The German magazine for football culture called El Freunde or 11 Friends after a quote that is commonly but wrongly credited to Sepp Herberger, the first national football manager in Germany after World War II, uh, it's the motto, you must be 11 friends to win the match. But that motto was engraved on the first football trophy that was used from 1903. So it's uh, considerably older. I close the footnote. So in its June is issue, uh, the um, El Freunde spoke out in large letters how much they were missing the fans in the empty stadiums. Ihr fehlt, miss you. And they added the conclusion, football without fans is just a game. Now, I Perhaps I should have written a letter to the editor because uh, without the fans, the football we are talking about is not just a game, but an investment. The games in empty stadiums were arranged as a measure to save the money from TV broadcasting stations for the clubs and not um, for the fun of playing the game of the professional athletes. And this hints as a, at a bigger difference. The same magazine contained an interview with fans of the Gelsenkirchen Club uh, club Schalke. The club has come under attack from its fans because of repeated scandals, a partnership with a ticket selling platform. So there's an interchange of internet commerce and sports commerce here, um, which is worth mentioning. Uh, so a partnership with a ticket selling platform uh, was criticized by the fans. Uh, it's the club's president's racist slurs in front of local entrepreneurs was criticized. The handing of the Corona crisis when fans were asked to waive their ticket refunds. And lastly, the operative problems of a club constantly underperforming uh, on the pitch. So in this uh, interview of last week's, supporters remembered the good old times and a promotional video that the club had produced after it had won the EuroLeague in 1997. So some 20 years ago, and suddenly I realized what I was missing, one of the supporters is quoted, the community, the team spirit, thousand friends standing together. It's notable that these feelings were prompted by watching an official promotional video. Obviously, then there was the consensus between the club and the fans at the time that emotions at play were not over-commercialized, but in such a manner that they remained relatively unharmed and authentic. In contrast now, the ghost games were perceived as inauthentic artificial performance performances. So from this, I conclude that the supporters are an example of the kind of communities that can resist global platform providers and change uh, this infrastructure. It's telling that Facebook operates with the term fans for those accounts that follow another. So the wording reveals the capitalization of these community forces and such a move should provoke resistance as it goes. Um, when I tried to formulate this idea, I discovered that somebody else had um, written about them. Uh, here, the most recent publication by Hans-Ulrich Gumbrecht, one of uh, the most mo more prominent German sports philosophers, who points out in his long essay um, that the, the crowd is an essential and integral part of a football match and it's the corresponding power that makes sports attractive to investors as well. So there's a, a kind of double bind that what 
uh, enables the community to express itself and to um, live up to its emotions is also what is attractive to investors and uh, is bound to be commercialized. So with fans, football is an asset and it's complicated to protect the innocence of fandom in such an environment. Um, so um, the games that we're talking about, these ghost games, um, they were more than just uh, a game. Um, so it seems to be the perfect moment to discuss these matters because the corona crisis has sparked off a line of ideas and thoughts about the status quo of uh, international sports, its commer commercial foundations and the cultural role it plays or wants to play. The editor of this now often quoted uh, Freunde magazine has just demanded that fans should organize themselves, become visible entities and start unions. So legal instruments of collective labor law are now suggested as a real option to support, uh, to empower supporters and to strengthen their communities. Uh, there are recent precedents that go even further. Um, in Manchester, the FC United of Manchester was founded in 2005 by Manchester United supporters who opposed the American businessman Malcolm Glazer's takeover of the Premier League club. Today, the FC United is the largest fan-owned football club in the United Kingdom by number of members. And it's democratically run by its members. Um, the club seems to have been the model for supporters of the Hamburger Sportverein who left their club in 2015 to start a new amateur club, the Hamburger Fußball Club Falke. And perhaps the most encouraging example, encouraging example of fans taking over their clubs is the AFC Wimbledon. The club was founded 2000 and two by supporters of the former Wimbledon football club, but that club relocated from Wimbledon to Milton Keynes, which is some 100 kilometers away, and supporters felt that the new club, which soon changed its name to Milton Keynes Dons, no longer represented their local community. So starting in the ninth tier of the English league system, the club has been promoted six times and is now playing in the third league one, which is um, occasionally the same league that the old club is currently playing in. So these examples have shown that communities are not helpless bunnies on a global monopoly platform. The decisive step is indeed to organize the community into an entity that is potentially a legal entity to turn culture into law. Uh, football clubs have proven the possibility and communities such as the artists against censorship on Instagram are now moving in the same direction. Mm -hmm. However, the frameworks are only similar, not identical, mm -hmm. and it would be a mistake to ignore the community's own values and interactions. Their normative limitations should be legitimized by a balance of mutual respect and consideration, but not by the commercial interests in shape of the terms and conditions of a communication platform. Thank you for your attention.